Let's pray, and we're going to hop back into Romans here, and finally getting into chapter 5, and hopefully we'll have a, a, a blessing of a time here together. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we do thank you for uh, what we've heard so far today. We are um, deeply convicted about our world, that there are not only people here who don't know you, but people all around the world who won't even get a chance to even hear the good news. And that certainly makes us feel burdened, doesn't it? And yet, Lord, we don't want that to be just a shame that doesn't really turn into anything, but we pray that those who have been called to go to missions would be faithful, and those who are called to stay here would be faithful as well. That we would just continue to grow and, and be willing to share our faith wherever we are. Thank you, God, that uh, you've brought us here. Thank you that we are in your word this morning in Romans 5. And as we do talk about some of the benefits and blessings of justification, I pray that you would give me the words to say this morning, that you would uh, encourage hearts as well, and yeah, that you would just give me the strength I need uh, to be able to say what you want me to say. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've been in uh, the Rook of Romans for a while. We've taken a bit of a break, and we came back. And of course, we talked about... A lot of things, haven't we? <clears throat> We've talked about, of course, sin. A lot about sin. We talked about our need of a Savior, of course. Uh, the last couple of weeks since we've come back in chapter 4, we learned about what it means to be justified and how God makes us right with himself. We learned about how that is something that is not something Paul invented, but it, it, uh, it of course, is taught in the Old Testament. And then last week, we talked a little bit about what true faith looks like, and we were challenged to take a look at our lives and our faith, and so hopefully that was an encouragement uh, to you. Today, I want to talk about, as I said, the benefits and blessings of justification. And so um, the fact that we're saved isn't just something up here, but it's actually something here. It's, it's, there, are, there are actually things that uh, do change in our lives, and we'll talk about some of those things today. And it's, it's pretty cool. There's some really cool stuff you could really do a deep dive on. Oh, we just don't have the time, but we'll try. So let's read the first five verses, reading from the New King James. Here's what he says. Of course, therefore connects to what he just said in chapter 4. Therefore, having been justified by faith, he says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith <clears throat> into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, if that wasn't enough, that wasn't great enough. But we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Now, hope does not disappoint. Why? Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So let's talk about some of these benefits of justification. The first thing he says is that we have peace with God. What does it mean that we have peace with God? Well, notice he isn't saying that we have the peace of God, which Philippians says is something that passes all understanding. No, it says we have peace with God. So here's a question for you. If we have peace with God now that we're justified, what does that imply about our standing with God before we were saved? I have peace now that implies I didn't have it before. And it's important to say that because there are many in the church today who would believe that all people, regardless of what they believe, are children of God. And yet the Bible would say very much the opposite. You know, we, we just talked about missions, right? If, if, if people in missions are, are just fine and they're just children of, they're already children of God and they're fine, then why are you going to the Philippines? Why are we going into missions if everyone's just fine, right? Now, the Bible says, in fact, that people are blinded by the God of this world. They are children of Satan, in fact. They are dead in their sins and their trespasses. <clears throat> and so to say that us as the enemies of God are now at peace with him is, is quite the incredible statement. Now, what does this mean practically for us? Well, it means a couple of things. First of all, it means that we've been reconciled to God, that we're no longer at war with him, that God is our father, God is our friend. Right? I think as well the idea of having peace with God means that whatever uh, troubled conscience we had before coming to know him has been dealt with. One author put it this way, and I, sometimes you know, commentaries put things beautifully, so I like to quote them. Here's what he said, Our guilty fears are silenced, and we are taught to look up to God with sweet serenity of soul. While we no longer conceive of him as an enemy, 
but under the endearing character of a father and a friend. And so, of course, we should have consciences sensitive to the Holy Spirit. When we sin, God should point that out, and hopefully he does. Right? But if we now have peace with God, we should not have a conscience that's terrorizing us anymore. And so if your life has a feelings of overwhelming guilt, the fear of hell, if you're living as if God is standing over you, waiting to crush you, right? Those are not feelings and attitudes that are consistent with someone who has peace with God. As well, and verse 2 we can just take a month on because there's so much there. He talks about this idea of having a permanent standing in grace. Let me read it again. And if we knew Greek, this this verse would blow up because there's so much there. Here's what he says. Through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So two things here. The first thing is that now that we have peace with God, we now have access into God's presence. And one author put it this way, and I think he he says it rightly, one may be reconciled to his prince and yet not be brought into his presence, right? So there's been a huge change, of course, in the new covenant. You guys are familiar with, of course, the Old Testament, uh, the Old Covenant, of course, the temple. There were specific areas you could go, certain areas you couldn't go. If you were a woman, you couldn't go to certain spots. If you were a Gentile, you could only sit in the court. That would be all of us almost. Right? And then, of course, there was one particular place in the temple nobody could go, called the Holy of Holies, where God's presence was. And only once a year the high priest could go, and he had to bring blood. Okay? But, of course, when Jesus died, something interesting happened with that big, thick curtain that was blocking off the temple. What was it? It tore from the top to the bottom, symbolizing what a great change has taken place. And so we now have direct access to God. And I think we underestimate how powerful that is, not being raised as a Jew, I think, and kind of just being raised in this kind of church culture. See, because we don't need any more priests to intercede for us. Why? Because Jesus is our high priest. We don't need to come to God with blood, so, you know, every time I pray to God, I don't have to bring a little lamb and slice his throat. No, I I don't have to bring blood. Why? Because Jesus has already shed his blood. And this might be the, the most amazing thing of all. I don't have to go in fearfully because we're coming into the presence no longer of an enemy, but of our father and friend. Hebrews 4.16 4, puts it this way. He says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. It's quite the statement, boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So first of all, what does it mean that I have peace with God? I can now go to God whenever I want. Pretty cool. And we should definitely take advantage of that as much as we can. We're told as well in this verse, and this is just so deep and so awesome, and I just love it. He says, we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And let me just read what some authors have written about this statement. One guy said this, a standing in grace, so so where are you standing? You're standing in grace, okay? You're not standing in law. You're not standing in condemnation. You're not standing separated from God. You're standing in his favor. Here's what one author said. A standing in grace reassures us God's present attitude towards the believer in Christ Jesus is one of favor. Okay, and not in the, the word faith thinking of favor like we talked about last month. It's not money and health, it's grace. Seeing them in terms of joy, beauty, and pleasure. He doesn't just love us, he likes us because we are in Jesus. We often think, well, yeah, yeah, God loves us. Did you know that God likes you too? It's not a bad thing. One author's... Uh, put it this way, the former rebels are not merely forgiven by having their due punishment remitted. They are brought into a place of high favor with God, this grace in which we stand. And so one of the benefits of justification is that God's attitude towards us has changed. Very interesting. We are now looked on and and given favor because of what Jesus has done. And here's the interesting thing. Even though I still sin and mess up all the time, I'm still in that place of favor. Pretty cool. And so because this is true, I don't have to prove that I'm worthy of God's love. I don't have to think, man, God's keeping score on me. No, God is for us and not against us. And as we'll see later on in Romans 8, God works all things out for our good and for his glory. And so as we think about what this really means, it's, it's not only important how we view God and how we view ourselves, but also what we think about how God now views us, that's important too. We have to really understand God actually views me in this way, in grace. 
okay, well, we've talked about this as well. I'm in this standing of grace. I'm, I'm in this place of favor. I certainly don't deserve it, do you? Of course not. This as well, <clears throat> this standing we now have is something that cannot be lost. And this is something that the Greek makes very clear. Let me read this for you. The perfect verb tense of have access also indicates that this is a standing, a permanent possession. Because our standing is based on grace, we really can stand and have peace because we know that our access is a permanent possession. It cannot be taken away at a later time. Okay, so other people agree with that as well, saying this, and this access to God or introduction to God's presence is to be considered a lasting privilege. We are not brought to God for the purpose of an interview, but to remain with him, to be his household, and by faith to behold his face and walk in the light of his countenance. So it's not like I'm just, you know, I'm in God's presence for a job interview and I could pass and I can fail. No, I passed because Jesus passed it for me, Amen. So now I've got permanent access to his presence. Pretty, pretty cool. And here's the amazing thing about this new position of grace that we're in. No matter, how, no, no matter what I do, how I feel, how I struggle, I remain in that place. I remain there. Because God is my Father. He loves me. He gives me what I need. He, he withholds things that I want, but that he knows I don't need. And the good news, of course, being that he even disciplines me when I go off the path, all of those are signs of his love for me, even when he spanks or bum, as it were. And you parents know when you discipline your kids, you do it because you love them, hopefully. Okay? Verse 3 says this, growth during tribulation, another benefit of justification. He says this, and not only that, <clears throat> but we also glory in tribulations, difficulty, sickness, suffering, whatever it is, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character and character hope. This has certainly been a week like this for my wife and I. Certainly, we've learned this verse is true in our lives, continuing to grow, hopefully. And so we can now look forward to times of difficulty, if we can even say that, because even the worst times of suffering are being used by God to grow me. Okay? And so I love what, uh, what uh, Spurgeon says about this verse, and I'm going to read it for you here, uh, because he, he really brings out the fact that naturally, this doesn't really come naturally to us. Hard times actually make us bitter, not thankful. Here's what he says. Tribulation works patience, says the apostle. Naturally, it is not so. Tribulation actually usually works, works impatience, and impatience misses the fruit of experience and sours into hopelessness. Ask many who have buried a dear child or have lost their wealth or who have suffered pain in the body, and they will tell you that the natural result of affliction is to produce irritation against God's providence, Rebellion against God, questioning, unbelief, petulance, and all sorts of evils. But what a wonderful alteration takes place when their heart is renewed by the Holy Spirit. And so there should be such a change in our lives when we're saved, such a change in our thinking, that when those times come, we get sick like we have been this past week. Persecution, difficulty, suffering comes. We begin to view God's hand in the situation. And we begin to go, okay, God, what are you going to do here? I don't want this to happen. I wish it wasn't happening but you're doing something. What are you trying to do? Something my wife and I really just told each other this week as we suffered through some things is I just said, you know, you know, you know Kim, it, it really seems like what God is wanting to do in our lives is he's just wanting to wean us off of this world. We're, we're, we're way too comfortable. We're way too content in where we are. Maybe what God is doing is, he, is he's weaning us off of this world. He's preparing us for the next one. And here's the thing. If we wrongly believe that God doesn't allow suffering into our lives, Okay? Then when those times come, we're just going to be crushed by it. We're going to blame the devil. We're going to blame ourselves. But if we can see that those times of suffering are allowed, or dare we even say ordained by God, and that he wants to use those times to grow you, well, that does change things. You begin to have expectancy when difficulty comes. Yeah, it sucks. You don't like it. But as the years go by, and you've seen, you look back and you go, I, 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 that last time you know, bad things happened, I grew. You learn to expect times of growth because you've seen it happen before. But again, that is not an attitude that comes naturally to us, is it? We want no suffering. I want happiness, no suffering, everything to go my way. And yet, when do we grow? During times of tribulation, more than anything. Of course, verse 5 again is one of these verses so full, so rich. 
another benefit to our justification. Here's what he says. Now, hope does not disappoint. So he just said that perseverance produces character, character produces hope. Now he's talking about hope. Then he's going to talk about love. Then he's going to talk more about love. Okay, there's the outline for you. Here's what he says. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts. What an amazing promise. By the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So practically, what does this verse mean? Why does, it, why does hope in God not disappoint? Of course, true biblical hope is a certainty. It's not, well, I hope things will work out, right? So what does this verse mean practically that the love of God is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit? I think this is not just a spiritual truth. It's an experience many of us probably have had. So what does it mean? I think it means a couple of things. First of all, I think it means that the Holy Spirit, before we were Christians, made us aware of God's love for us. See, you can read John 3.16 to a a non-believer, and they don't care. Why? Because God hasn't revealed to them what that really means. Okay? Somehow, some way, whatever it was for you, you read the Bible, someone shared with you, your parents shared their faith with you, whatever it was, God made you conscious of the love that he had for you in the gospel. Okay? One author puts it this way, this inward persuasion that we are the objects of the love of God is not just the result of the examination of evidence or a vain illusion, but it is produced by the Holy Spirit. Then he quotes Romans, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That's an experience. I know I'm God's child because his spirit has, has bear witness to mine. The Holy Spirit thus carries the love of God beyond our mere intellect into our inmost nature. So first of all, yeah, God shows us that he loves us in a way that we understand, that we didn't understand before. Secondly, I think what this means is that the love we now have for God, here's the thing, has been given to us by God. (laughs) You thought you loved God? You didn't. He gave you love even for him. The Bible says we now love him because he first loved us. And I, I remember when I first got saved, that was very much true. I was a guy who hated God, hated the Bible. Something happened. I love God. I love the Bible now. I don't know why that happened, but there was a change that happened in my life. Okay? And, and certainly that happened probably with many of you as well. Finally, I think the Holy Spirit who now, now indwells us as believers, he's constantly pointing us back to the love of Christ because we're stupid and have to be reminded all the time, don't we? That he loves us and that he gave himself for us. One author put it this way, it is the testimony of the Spirit that convinces us richly and daily that God loves us that his love is our full property in Christ. So he doesn't hold back his love, right? Our Savior, we are absolutely sure and certain of our blessedness. The love of God resting upon Christ's death is the sufficient and certain foundation of our hope of future salvation. Okay? So as we walk through difficulties in life, we grow. Okay? We grow. It's very important. Verses 6 to 11 are interesting. I am... Still wondering where in the context this fits, but he brings up this greatness of God's love, I think just because he mentioned God's love is poured in our heart. Paul likes to go on tangents, which I have a lot in common with him, I think, maybe in that way. Here's what he says in verse 6. And this is a good verse to share with your non-Christian friends. It's it's pure gospel, very amazing. Here's what he says. So God's love is great because we're we're weak and pitiful and, and sinful, basically, I think is what he's saying here. For when we were still without strength, boy, is that true, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Didn't die for the good person. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. Maybe the president or a prime minister or something. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, like like, like we're currently nailing him to the cross, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. We'll talk about that in a minute. For if when we were enemies, so this is the comparison, right? We were his enemies. We were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more than having been reconciled. We shall be saved by his life. That means right now. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. And so right away we see God's love is demonstrated to us, not just because Jesus died, because other people die for all sorts of things all the time. We see Jesus' love, not just in the fact that he died, but because of who it is that he died for. That expands the scope of his love, because he doesn't just die for good people. He died for me. He died for you. He died for sinful people. So first of all, he says, you have no strength. 
Christ died for the ungodly. We had nothing inside of us to persuade him, to make him do anything for us. He died for us when we had nothing. As well, he says, are you still a sinner? Christ died for you. Of course, he used, talks about this righteous man and a good man. He says, you know, there might be a certain man somewhere, somewhere where you might go and die for him. Maybe men, you'd die for your wives, or you know, a guy will take a bullet for the president or something. Okay? But Christ demonstrates his love, his, his great, great love in comparison, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. While we shouted out, crucify him, when we nailed him to the cross, he forgave us. While we were abusing him and destroying him and making him bleed, he was in the process of reconciling the world to himself. That's why we have to tell everyone about this love. Amen? It's incredible. It's incredible news. As well, he says, much more than, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. What does he mean that we'll be saved from wrath? Obviously, probably speaking of hell, that's probably the first thing we would think of. As well, I think it means in general, God does not deal with us on the basis of wrath anymore but on grace and love, which I think is pretty cool. And so when I sin, God doesn't pour his wrath out on me anymore. He disciplines me and deals with me like a son. Very different, okay? So it's not like I'm, I'm his friend and I'm his son, <clears throat> and then I sin and now I'm his enemy again and he pours out his wrath. That doesn't happen. What was in the cup? Remember last Good Friday? What did Jesus drink in the cup? The wrath of God was in the cup. Okay, he turns over the cup, not a drop comes out. There is no more wrath for you as a Christian. Something else I think he might be saying is, is this. Romans 5 is a bit of a, bit of a door hinge. We're really heading into chapter 6 uh, in a couple weeks, and he's really heading into the new section of the book. We talked about justification a bunch. The fact that God has saved us from the penalty of our sins, which is hell. Where we're heading next week, kind of, and especially in chapter 6, is the fact that not only has Jesus just died for our sins, but that Jesus has died to set us free from the power of sin in our lives. And so whatever that sin in your life is, that, 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 that addiction, that thing that you're drawn to, that thing you keep falling into, Jesus is actually paid to set you free from that as well. And so that wrath, of course, I think has to do with that slavery to sin. And then, of course, he says in verse 10, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. What does it mean that I shall be saved by the life of Jesus? I think it has to do not only with my future salvation in heaven someday, but because the Holy Spirit lives inside of me, because the life of Jesus in some way somehow is inside of me, that is setting me free progressively from sin in my life. He lives inside of me, and so I am becoming more free. It's pretty cool. And again, there's so much we can say about that passage, but we're just blazing through it. Let me ask you a question. There's some people here I haven't seen in a while or some, some guests. Let me ask you a question. Since Christ died for the absolute worst, if you're still rejecting him, what's your excuse? One author, Spurgeon, of course, I like quoting him. He said this, and I'll quote him because he says it best. He said this, you will say, oh, I am the one of the worst in the world. <clears throat> well, Christ died for the worst in the world. Oh, but I have no power to be better. Christ died for those that were without strength. Oh, but my case condemns itself. Christ died for those that were legally condemned. Ah, but my case is hopeless. Christ died for the hopeless. He is, in fact, the hope of the hopeless. He is, not the savior. He is the Savior not only of those partly lost, but of the person who's wholly lost. <laughs> and, and I love his, his, his exhortation here. He says, if Christ died for the ungodly, this fact leaves the ungodly no excuse if they do not come to him and believe in him for salvation. Had it been otherwise, they might have pleaded, we're not fit to come. But you are ungodly, and Christ died for the ungodly, so why not for you? I love that. So there's no excuses anymore. We have to come to him. We have to come to him. Well, let me ask you a question. Is everything I've read so far, <clears throat> I think in particular, of this, but also everything else we read. Do you believe, at least on paper, that what we've read is true? Okay. Of course, many of you would say that you believe that. Here's the question I have for you. Take it home. Do you believe that all we've read so far is true of you? That you have peace with God? 
that you have a permanent standing in God's favor and grace, that you can grow during times of tribulation? Do you believe the love of God is important to your heart by the Holy Spirit? All these things we could say, do you believe it is true of you? <clears throat> Let me ask this. How many of us are actually experiencing the benefits of our justification in our daily experience? So not just, yeah, yeah, I believe it, and yeah, yeah, some legal thing happened, and now I'm good. Are you actually experiencing the love of God being poured out in your heart? Are you growing in that? Are you growing when, when hard times come? If not, why not? And here's a question, what happens when our feelings and our experiences seem to say the exact opposite of what the Bible teaches? For example, when your conscience condemns you and you have no peace. So we're told that we have peace with God. What happens when your conscience tells you you have no peace? We've been told that we have access into God's presence. What happens when God feels far away? Or when trouble seems to just consume us, you say, God, I'm not learning anything from this. It's just killing me. How about when the love of God in Christ is the last thing on our mind? Where are the promises of God during those times when we struggle? This is where faith comes in. We walk by faith and not by sight. Faith is the key. And I'm using this word appropriating because, because I don't want to say unlocking or receiving because that makes it sound like it's not ours. No, appropriating is taking what's already in our bank account and just withdrawing it for ourselves. It's already ours. <clears throat> faith is the key to appropriating for ourselves in our daily experience all of the blessings of our justification. So here's the thing. Everything we've read and said this morning is already true of you if you're a Christian. And no matter what happens, and no matter how you feel, it's true. But faith is that connection between what God says is true of me in the Word and what I actually experience in my daily life. And this is going to be very important uh, when we get to chapter 6, 7, and 8, because he's going to start saying some things maybe you've never heard before, maybe you've never really thought about. Things like, you're not a slave to sin anymore. That, that you don't actually have to sin the way you maybe still do. And this isn't just positive thinking, because positive thinking is taking something that isn't true <laughs> and believing that if I just believe hard, hard enough, it'll become true. No, Faith is taking the promises of God that we read in his word and believing them for ourselves. Even, here's the key, even when my feelings and experiences say the opposite. So the Bible says I'm free from sin. What happens if I don't feel free? Am I free? I am free. Nothing's changed. My feelings change, right? I go up, I go down. I believe lies of the devil maybe, okay? What was Abraham's faith like? Believing even when it didn't make much sense. Not faltering in unbelief, but being fully convinced in his mind that what God had promised he would do. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Abraham looked forward to something that, that he hoped would happen. We're not waiting on God to fulfill a promise. He's given us all of this already. What we've read today are the benefits of justification, whether we ever believe it for ourselves or not. Someone can, can live their whole life as a Christian <coughs> with a troubled conscience and die and go to heaven. They never access the benefit they had. Okay? Why does there seem to be such a disconnect in our lives? Many of us walk, walk out the door Sunday morning, our brain shuts back off or turns on or whatever it is. Maybe your brain shut off right now and you're not listening, you know, on or off. And it doesn't matter anymore. And we just kind of walk through life in a fog. Well, I think, again, it's so important in our lives that we walk by faith and not by sight. Here's the thing, you and I cannot allow our feelings to run our lives. And, many, and in many ways we do. Amen? In many ways we do. I'm feeling sad today, so that's going to run my day. Oh, I'm feeling really good today, so God must be good today. Okay? So the world lies to us, the enemy distracts us, our bodies get tired and sick, our emotions can be all over the place, but here's the truth. <clears throat> what God's word says about me and you is true period. And part of my spiritual growth as a Christian isn't receiving more. We already have it. Growth as a Christian is believing what the Bible says and growing in that belief. That's really all Christian growth is. You have everything. Now believe it. That's all Christian growth is. Why does it seem today like so many believers aren't experiencing, and this is me as well, aren't experiencing the benefits of their salvation today? Well, I think, first of all, it's the fact that we don't know our Bibles very well. We're not reading it. We're not studying it. We're not growing, right? We're not taking the time to understand what's being read. 
I think for some of us, maybe what I've said here sounds good on paper, but it's just sort of a spiritual truth out there. It doesn't matter to me once I walk outside of these doors. Here's the thing. You can be a born-again Christian and choose to stay at the gates of the palace, never going into the throne room if that's what you choose. And that's so many of us in our lives. Maybe because we believe that we're not allowed in. Maybe we believe that God doesn't really want to spend any time with us. But what are you missing out on if that's your decision? You're missing out on God and all he has for you. And, and really in exchange for what? The world? Shiny toys? Here's the thing. All, and this is really, I think, the book of Romans in a big way. All Christians have a wealth of spiritual blessings that are their birthright in Christ, but not all will experience them, either because they don't know about them, which is why we're teaching this book of Romans, or they have not chosen to believe it for themselves. What a sad state of affairs it is when we have access to the king anytime we want. It's not like I knock on the door and sometimes he's busy. He's got time for me. He's got time for you. And for billions of others at all the same time. What a sad state of affairs it is when we have access to the king and we decide to sit outside the doors of his gates like a beggar who has no right to go in. We live in ignorance of what God has done and we pay for it with our lives and testimonies that do not reflect who we really are in Christ. Brothers and sisters, it doesn't have to be that way, does it? We can read the word. We can believe it. We can grow in a relationship with him. Amen? We can spend time with him anytime we want. Drop what we're doing. As you're working, as you're living, as you're walking through your day, you can talk to him. You can walk with him. Amen? You can spend time with him. I think some of us, maybe we have heavy consciences or we're just too busy in our lives. I don't know what it is. But if we really believe everything we've read here this morning, our relationship with God should be full and should be free and should be exciting. Amen? Should be. Anytime I get to be with him, he's available. Pretty cool. Got a hard one next week in the end of chapter five. You can, you can pray about that one. It'll be interesting to talk about. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you have given us so many benefits in our salvation, <clears throat> many benefits that we haven't even read about, maybe, benefits that we struggle to believe, that you love us the way you say you love us, that we can access your presence at any time, that we are standing in a place of permanent grace, that even difficult times are being used for our good and for your glory. God, it's hard for us to see that when our bodies are weak. It's hard to see that when our mind is, is, is foggy. It, it's hard to believe that when the entire world seems to be saying the opposite as the nations rage against you. It's hard for us sometimes to rest in you and your presence. And yet, God, you invite us, I trust, into that close relationship with you, that we can get into the word not just sort of reading our one chapter and closing it, but really digging in and learning and growing together. And, uh, and God, you, you, you promise us so many uh, great and amazing things, and we know that uh, those things are ours in Christ. We don't uh, suddenly own them because we believe. No, but we, we just receive what we already have when we trust and believe what you have to say. And so the Christian life, in many ways, God, is very simple, and yet it's, it's also very difficult, isn't it? Because faith is a very, very hard thing to do sometimes, especially in a culture like ours that is um, instant and wanting instant gratification especially. So God, thank you. Thank you for our, our time together today. We, we pray as we head forward this week and continue to serve you in various ways. We ask that you would give us the strength to do so, but that we, also that we would enjoy uh, serving you, that we would enjoy um, just getting to, to serve you and, and getting to be with you. May we never forget, God, not only that we get to serve and, and be busy for you, but that we get you and that we get to be with you, and that we get to know you um, and, and your power and your resurrection. And so, God, we, we lift up each person here to you. We don't know where each one is at, but you do. And so I pray, God, that each of us would get a very special invitation this afternoon to the King's Chamber, that we would go and spend some time with you, and that you would refresh our hearts to prepare us for what you have for us this upcoming week. We thank you for our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.